So in order to fully understand why blockchains were created, how they were created, there's another aspect that we have to examine, and that's the history of digital and cryptocurrency. So let's go back to the 1980s for a mini history lesson about the formation of the World Wide Web. Now, I'm sure most people have gotten something called an Air 404, page not found. Basically what that means is you sent a request to a server and it could not be fulfilled because the URL was wrong or the basically direction that was taking you was blocked off. Uh, these Air 404 is part of the World Wide Web protocols uh, that were written around this time. Interesting note about these protocols, 404 is the most common, but there's several others that were outlined at the time of the creation of the World Wide Web. And while you might have heard of Air 404, probably haven't heard of Air 402. What that is, is insufficient payment or payment required. Probably has never gotten uh, this message because, well, there's no native currency built into the internet yet. What this does show us is that the creators of the World Wide Web distinctly had a, the idea that there could be or should be a digital currency that would work along concert with the rest of the World Wide Web. So this was really possibly the first time that the idea of a digital currency was actually introduced. And this led to a bunch of digital cash experiments digital currency experiments over the next 20, about 20 years that ultimately would lead to the creation of Bitcoin. Now, what do all of these uh, projects have in common? There's a few things. The first is that they all contributed technology that would ultimately be put together to make blockchain technology. The other is that several of these projects failed because they were centralized. They had a point of failure that could simply be shut down. And that's what happened with many of them. Additionally, there's another thing that these have in common, that these projects have in common, kind of goes alongside the second point. Uh, none of them really made it because they were beat by PayPal. In 1998, PayPal was launched and really took money transmission across the internet from a very small amount or small level to uh, one that has grown into a complete payment juggernaut today. So like I said, the problem with many of these projects is that they were vulnerable to attacks. Every single transaction or action went through a central server. And this client server model basically is how our whole internet works today. For example, let's say you're sending a message, a uh, Facebook message to a friend. That's you. That computer is your friend right there. Now, what happens is that message does not go directly from you to your friend. No, it has to be processed through a central server to execute the action. Now, while this is very efficient, there are a couple problems with this model. Like I said, central, central servers are uh, single points of failure that could basically create a vulnerability that could put these projects at risk or have, or even put out the possibility that these projects could be shut down. So the problem with these projects is that they were vulnerable to attacks because they relied on central servers. And this isn't just endemic to those specific projects. This is actually how our whole internet is built, how everything is conducted. For example, let's say you're sending a Facebook message from uh, you to your friend's computer. You aren't directly sending that message to your friend. No, you have to send it to a server, Facebook server, which then has to facilitate the transaction. In order to do so, in that process, the server isn't just going to facilitate the transaction, it's also going to, be, it's also going to store data. And this can be dangerous because some of that data can include personal data, like your social security number. This makes these servers targets for attacks. All of that personal data equates to money. And if yours gets compromised, it's not a fun process. This isn't just a theory, it's already happening. There's been countless hacks. 
from Target to the Equifax hack, a credit reporting institution, that compromised the data of about 140 million Americans. It's a really significant portion of the American populace. So these projects that had central servers that act as repositories are bad news for your personal data. So is there a way to bypass this whole model known as the client server model of which our internet is built upon? Let me introduce decentralized networks. Now this is direct response to these central points of failure that would, could ultimately compromise uh, your data integrity. Decentralized network, notice how it's a completely different layout. It's more of a web. There's no reliance on a central server, which again, can be a target for hacks. Instead, it's made up of members of the network that have a copy of all of the transaction data so everybody knows who has what at what given time. So let's define Bitcoin. Bitcoin is both the name of a token and its network. As the first cryptocurrency and implementation of blockchain technology, there was no practical differentiation on inception, but that has since changed. So let's define a couple terms I just introduced in that definition. First is cryptocurrency, and cryptocurrency is just a digital currency that's created and secured through a mining process that uses cryptography. Now, a blockchain is a technological backbone that allows cryptocurrencies to function. So in order to sum it all up, this sentence says it all. Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency token, changes ownership on the Bitcoin network, which utilizes blockchain technology. That's how all of these concepts fit together. Now, there are certain values behind blockchain. For example, Satoshi had certain values that he wanted to carry over to the network. And that is anti-censorship, resilient to infrastructure problems, intentional or accidental, basically saying that if you want to spend your money, no institution can stop you. There's no way to stop you from spending your money or sending it to whoever you want on the Bitcoin network. Transparency is a big aspect of blockchain technology. Uh, that digital receipt that I mentioned earlier, that's public to everybody, basically has all the details of what just occurred on the blockchain, all that transaction data. It's uh, easy to simply look up a transaction that happened as, many, as far back as the inception of the blockchain because everything is recorded. And again, every member of the network has a copy of that ledger. Additionally, trustless transactions is a big part, a big value behind uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. So transactions can be made in the absence of trust. This is an important uh, economic example or principle that I would like to go over with you so you understand a little bit more. Uh, general principle, the less trust there is between parties in a transaction, conducting a transaction, the more facilitators that are going to be, have to br be brought on in order to ensure that trust. Best example of that is, let's say I am selling apples for a dollar. Um, now I'm interacting with the apple, or somebody's interacting with me, the apple vendor. I'm not sure if they are going to pay me that dollar for the apple. They might just take my apple and run off. Therefore, I need apple insurance. Let's say the apple insurance is 15 cents per apple. Now, that 15 cents isn't just going to be ate by the vendor, me. No, I'm going to pass that along to the, that cost along to the consumer. The less trust there is, the more middlemen that have to be brought in, the more expensive that that transaction is going to cost in order to facilitate. That's why blockchain technology focuses on a trustless aspect. So transactions can be made in the absence of trust. By that we mean you don't have to trust somebody in order to, uh, don't have to trust the other party in order to confidently execute, uh, execute a transaction. All you have to do is trust the protocol trust the Bitcoin software. And the best part about that is it's open source. Anybody can go look at the code. 